Welcome to all of our Facebook followers. Uh, I know many of you are wondering where I was, because I wasn't on for the last couple of weeks, but I was, uh, I was at some meetings with, uh, with uh, Reinhard Bonnke's ministry, Daniel Kalenda in Florida, and uh, just seeing what's going on on the other side of the world and with these other ministries. So I got a lot of good stuff out of the meetings, so, but it's always good to be back preaching in my own uh, church uh, establishment. So welcome to you again, and, and uh, thank you for joining in. Well, today I want to talk to you about gifts and callings. See, there's, there's not one of us that is not necessary. Every one of us is necessary. The Bible tells us they're all, they're all, we're all built together. We're all like, like stones. Peter calls us little stones that are built up, making this house for God, a house of worship. God is putting us together. He's putting up an army together. You know, over the years there has been an army of God, but it's been kind of scattered. It hasn't been... It hasn't been tied together like God intends us. And God wants to tie us all together. Because the Bible says he's coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. A glorious church. And the only way we're going to get that way is when, when we as a church, you know, unify uh, with our, in all of our gifts and callings. There's a scripture I always wondered about over in Peter. It says that we can hasten the coming of the Lord. That even though he has a planned time, we, he'll accelerate it if we will press in and he will come for his church. But every one of us is necessary. You have a mission and I have a mission. I know it's, I know it's uh, pretty easy to look at a, a preacher, a pastor, uh, an evangelist, people you, you hear and see on TV and and. Sometimes we put these people on a pedestal, and I know the Bible says that those who minister in a word should receive double honor, but every one of us deserve honor. Every one of us are deserving because we have a calling, we have a purpose. God has a plan for your life. He put a plan together for you from the day you were conceived, and it's up to you whether you follow it or not. I know the first 30 years of my life or so, I didn't follow God. I was just following my own desires. I was following my own way and how I thought and what I wanted. And, uh, I, you know, and I, really what I did is I, I got myself in a big mess is what I did. I was in a big mess. My, you know, my, my life had fallen apart. I, have spent, I felt like the prodigal son. I, I spent all I had on, on partying and whatever it was. and My body, I, I had ruined my body. I was ready to die because I, I had, I had um, abused my body so much with, with the things of the world. And then, then I found Jesus. And when Jesus came into my life, <clears throat> everything changed. Everything changed. I started to get on the path that God had for my life. Now, I mentioned this uh, times before in my preaching that I knew I was called to be a preacher when I was 12 years old. I, re I remember it well. I remember God putting it in my spirit. I didn't know what it was at the time, but I do now. And many of you have that same thing. Maybe not to be a preacher, but God has a calling in your life, something he wants for you to do. And a lot of people know it, and the reason a lot of people get in trouble in their life is because we're fighting God. Remember the story about Jonah? Uh, God told Jonah to go and tell the Nivenites to repent or he was going to destroy them. But Jonah wouldn't do it. Jonah didn't like them people. He said, no, I ain't going to tell them. Let them die and go to hell. I don't care. I mean, that's how his, that's what his attitude was. And Jonah, life began to fall apart, where finally he was... We, we see he was uh, swallowed by a great fish and, and he was actually taken to the, to the depths of hell. Till finally he repented and went and told Nineveh that, uh, you know, if you don't change your ways, uh, God's going to destroy you. And, you know, lo and behold, they believed him. 
and they all repented. And then he got mad they repented. <laughs> I mean, he wasn't happy that they all, got, all came to God, but that, that's the way Jonah's life was, but that's because he was running from God. And that's the way my life was too, running from God. But I know God has a calling for each of us. Let's go over to the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter one. Jeremiah chapter one, verse number four. <clears throat> The Bible says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you, and I have ordained you a prophet to the nations. So this is an example. You know, the Bible says God's no respecter of persons. So what he does for one, he does for another. So in other words, God call, has called you from your mother's womb. When you were conceived, when God put the, once you were, when you were conceived, God put a spirit into that body that your parents made. But he, that, that, that uh, spirit that came in was programmed by God to do something. It says here that, that uh, Jeremiah was ordained to be a prophet. Well, not everybody's ordained to be a prophet. Jeremiah was. I guess if I would say, from, a, from my mother's womb, God ordained me to be a pastor, because that's what my calling is. You're not, you, whatever your calling is, whether, whether it's in, uh, in uh, full-time ministry, or whether it's in helps ministry, administrations, whether it's in you know, uh, moving in the gifts of the Spirit, whether, whether it's in helps, whether it's in mercy, God has put in something in you. You know, I always tell people, a lot of people wonder, well, what do I do? What is my calling? What am I supposed to do? I don't know. Well, usually what it is, is what, what is your passion? What is your passion in life? I was just talking to my daughter here last week, and, and I asked her about, she said, all I care about is music. Well, that's, I mean, she, you all know Jessica, and she's a singer. That's what she should be doing. That's her whole passion. What is your passion? Is your pa you know, some people have, have passion for music. Some people have passion for, for uh, helping other people. Some people have passion for cooking. You know, you can, do, you can minister in your cooking because there's a gift in the Bible called the gift of hospitality. So whatever it is, if you want to find out what your calling is like, look inside of you. What is your passion? What do you want? And, and I know it can change because sometimes you might want something and some, sometimes you might want something else. You know, my, somebody might say, well, my passion is to have a million dollars. Well, that's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's some, what is your passion in life? What would, you, what would you do? What would you do in life even if you didn't get paid for it? That, that would be your passion. See, even if I never got paid for preaching, I'd still preach. I mean, I love it, so this is what I do. This is what I've been doing. What would you do in life? You know, what is your passion that you would do and even not get paid for it? That is what you should be going after. Go, go out, follow after that dream. Because God so told Jeremiah that he, he sanctified him. He set him apart to be a prophet. In Romans chapter 11, verse 29, it says, the gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. That means you can't change it. You have a calling, I have a calling. I don't care how you fight it, uh, if, you, if you are fighting it, if a lot of people fight it. They don't want to do what God tells them, you know, put in their heart to do. But God's not going to take it back. He's not going to say, oh, well, okay, if you don't want to do that, then I'll give you another job. He don't do that. You, you have the makings to do whatever it is you're called to do. You don't have the makings. Everybody does not have the making to be a preacher. I've seen so many people, and, you know, they're probably, uh, in their heart, they're probably uh, thinking they're doing right, but they, they, they'll go up and say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start a church, I'm going to be a pastor. But if you don't have a calling for it, it don't work. You know, it's nice because sometimes people get up and you stand in front of people and people are looking at you and you might feel special. But you know, after you do that, after you do one sermon, 10 sermons, 50 sermons, 100 sermons, 
it gets to be hard if you're not called. I have never had trouble preaching because I've never had trouble uh, getting stuff from the Word of God, getting stuff from God, because that's my calling. I've been, I've been doing full-time ministry for 26 years, and sometimes I preach, you know, um, 100 to, to 200 sermons a year, and every one of them, I, don't, I, don't, you, I never go back and, you know, very seldom, I can't say I never did, uh, re-preach the same sermon. I, God gives me something new every week. It's something different. And so you can't just do something because you want to do it. You do it, you know, you do it because this is your calling that you have in you. God's not going to change his mind. Let's go over to Psalm 139. Psalm 139. This is really, really funny because uh, when, when I was writing down some notes for this sermon, I was thinking of this scripture, and in my head I'm thinking, I know the scripture, but where is it? I know it's in Psalms, but where is it? And I, was, I had my Bible, I, I had just opened it up on, and it was sitting on my, on my table, and I said, where is it? I looked down on it, and I was right there at it, Psalm 139. And then Peter got up and started speaking this morning, and he spoke Psalm 139. I don't know if he, if he heard himself say it, but he did. And it talks about that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, that you are called from your mother's womb. In Psalm 139, verse 13, it says, For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. You know, this is what God is talking about you. The, the psalmist says that, that I, am, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. Sounds a little conceited. Eh? Looks in the mirror and says, wow, man, look at me. How marvelous. Look how marvelous I am. Well, I'm marvelous because God made me. You are marvelous because God made you. Doesn't matter your hair color, your eye color, your skin color, you know, how, however you think about yourself. That's the way God made you because you are perfect for you. You wouldn't, if, 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 if my spirit was in your body, it wouldn't work. Your spirit wouldn't work in my body because it's not made for it. You are made for you. When God formed you in the womb, he put, in, he put that spirit in, in your body and it perfectly fits you. That's why it says here, you are marvelous. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. It says, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book, they all were written. The days of, of the days fashioned for me when as yet there were none, none of them. So in other words, God wrote out this plan for you when you were still in your mother's womb. That's why it's such a horrendous thing when they, they're doing abortions. This baby in the body, it says before it was even formed, before it was unformed, there was, there was just these couple of cells got together and, and as soon as that, soon as that happened, do you, do you ever hear this when, when at conception, when the sperm uh, gets in and it fertilizes the egg, as soon as it fertilizes the egg, there's a flash of light. Why? Because the, that's the light of the word of God. That's the light of God. God puts that, as soon as, it, as soon as it's formed, God sends a spirit and puts it in there and there's a flash of light. They know that there is a flash of light. And that's when that baby has, has been, that baby has life. You know, I don't care what men say, well, it's not really a baby until it's formed. No, God, God wrote the days of that baby down before it was unformed. It says here, and in your book, all my days were written. See, the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. He'll not take them away. Because God has your life laid out for you. This is what I want my son to do. This is what I want my daughter to do. Even before you had him, God has written down what he wants for you next week. God has written down what he wants for you next year. 
God has what written down every day of your life. This is what I desire for my children. We know what Jeremiah says about, about it. I know my thought, the thoughts I have for you, the thoughts of good. You know, he wants, he wants your life to be good. He wants everything about you to be good. This is, this is what God has fashioned for us before we, we were even formed. The Spirit was there. He has given us a, perf a purpose. We have gifts and callings. Now, the weakest among us, which we consider, now, th now this is what man considers, okay? The weakest. Well, they can't never move. God will never use them. They're too weak. How about this woman? Her name is, I don't know if you ever heard of this woman. Her name is Johnny. Johnny Erickson Tata. I mean, would you think that she would, she is paralyzed from the neck down. And would you pick somebody like that to be, have a big ministry? But she does. She does. The busiest people about, the busiest people in the world. Some people will say, well, I, I can't do that. I'm too busy. See, but God will use the busiest people. You know, some, there's, a, there's a saying in the world, if you want something done, give it to a busy person. See, because busy people can always become busier. We, we always know how to make a way to do something else. The most unlikely people. If you think, well, I, I don't have any talents. I, what can I do? These are the type of people God looks for. These are the type of people. The most unlikely. And also, he does look for knowledgeable people. He looks for wise people. He looks for all types of people. So you fit in that category someplace. In 1 Samuel chapter, well, let's go look at 1 Samuel chapter 16. Never look in the mirror and look at yourself and say, well, I, I'm just so-and-so. What can I do? You know, I, I, th I think about Pastor Solomon and I. We are, we are, there was a show on TV years ago called The Odd Couple. I think Pastor Solomon and I could be considered that the odd couple. Here I am from Ironwood, Michigan. And here he is from Uganda, Africa. The two of us meet. I mean, neither one of us I, you know, have, have anything financially or, or we don't have you know, big resources or anything behind us, but we made a connection and God used us. God used us in that partnership to bring the gospel to millions and millions of people. You know, and he had it all laid out. He had it laid out in, his, in, his, in my life that I was going to have a church called the Lighthouse Faith Center. And Solomon was going to have a church in Africa. He had that all laid out. All of, you, all of you have become part of all that. This is something God has ordained for you. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. I always say you're not, you're not here by accident. You're here, but you're, you have a purpose so in 1 Samuel 16, 7, it says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see a man, see as man sees. For God looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So God's looking at what's inside of you. He's not looking at your outward appearance or what physically you are capable of doing. Because he can change you in a moment of time. He took Samson and made, it, made him a mighty man. That, that he had strength to, to defeat armies by himself. God did that. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he did it. So uh, God looks at, at the heart of man. Look at verse 11. Now 
Samuel went through and he looked at all of uh, Jesse's sons and none of them, none of them fit, the, fit the bill uh, that Samuel knew he had to choose. Verse 11, and Samuel said to Jesse, and then he said, there remains yet the youngest, and there he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for, for we will not sit down till he comes in. And that was David. David was keeping the sheep. So the father didn't even think that this son had any chance of doing anything. And David became the king. David became so much that even to this day, David's lineage is still a ruling factor in, in all of Israel. Jesus came out of the, from the lineage of David. So out of these eight sons, he said, well, this, this guy's just a shepherd. Well, God doesn't look on the outward appearance. Maybe you would say, well, I'm just a housewife. Or I just work at McDonald's. Or I'm, I'm, I work at Walmart. What am I... God doesn't care. That doesn't make a difference. God's looking at what's in you, not what you're doing, what's inside of you. So God called him. Remember another man in the Bible, Gideon? Gideon was in the Bible. The Bible says that Gideon was, uh, he, he was hiding in a thre on the threshing floor. He was hiding because he, did, well, he was afraid of the Midianite army. So he was hiding, he was threshing wheat. And an angel showed up and came to him and talked to him. And the angel said to him, the angel called him a mighty man of valor. But on the outside, he was a scaredy cat hiding from the army. But God took this man, Gideon, one man, took him to defeat this whole army. See, don't look at the outward. Don't look at, at who you are outwardly. <clears throat> Find out who you are inwardly. What God has put in, in your heart. So maybe some of you are hiding like Gideon was. Thinking, well, what can I do? Remember, the Bible says with God all things are possible. Amen? All things are possible. You might be a world shaker. You might be inside of you. I don't, you know, don't say, don't even let this thought cross your mind. Well, me? Who am I? Because that's what, that's what uh, David's father thought about David. That's what Gideon thought about himself. Well, who am I? I mean, I thought about, think that about me. Who am I? That's what I thought. But we have, we have changed the world. This ministry, what is Lighthouse Faith Center? What are we, a handful of people? We have changed the history of Africa. The nation of Africa, the country of Uganda is changed because of Ironwood. That's... that's an amazing thing. And now we're going into other countries. We're actually partnering now. I'm, I'm, I hooked up with another ministry that we are part, partnering in West Africa now. And so God might be calling on us to do some stuff over there. Reinhard Bonnke said when God spoke to him, all of Africa must be saved. And for some reason, Africa's in my heart. God put it in there, probably, like he said, in, you know, from, from my, my uh, days in my mother's womb, he put Africa in my heart. I love Africa. For some reason, Africa's just got inside of me. And, you know, we, we, have, we have touched that country or that continent mightily with the word of God. So don't hide from the things of God. Get, get into the things of God. So some of these people were, um, were pretty um, mild-mannered people. They, there was nothing special about them. But then let's look at one other one. Let's go to Acts chapter 9. You know, God, God does use other people. God uses, he'll use people 
like he did the Apostle Paul. Now the Apostle Paul was a very learned man. The Apostle Paul was, was he called himself a Pharisee of Pharisees. He, he was taught by the greatest teachers in, in uh, Israel. He, was, he, had, he had a lot of power. But see, God can use the, the, the little shepherd boy and he can use the, the, uh, the, the great man of uh, Israel. In Acts chapter 9, verse 1, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So Saul was a very, what we'd call, and we'd, today we'd probably call him a very evil person. He was killing Christians, he was bringing them, he was putting them in prison. He even asked letters from the high priest to go to other countries and find anybody who's following this Jesus guy. Verse number three. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard the voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the city, and you will be told what you must do. See, Saul thought he was doing right. He thought he was doing right. He thought he was, he was coming against the, the Christians. Who had, who had accepted this guy Jesus as their savior, and, uh, and they were turning the religious people of, of um, the, the Jews upside down. So Jesus appeared to him. Sometimes we need a shake up. Sometimes you're, you need a shake up. I mean, God, had, God shook me up. Believe me, he shook me up. I mean, he appeared to me in a, in a ball of fire in my house. He didn't just appear and say, boom, here I am. He was there for three hours. I mean, that shook me up. Sometimes we need a shake-up. Sometimes you need a shake-up. You know what happens a lot of times? Remember what I talked about Jonah? Sometimes people get their lives get so out of order Nothing's working. Everything's falling apart. They're, they're sick unto death. They're, 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 they're uh, uh, hooked on alcohol and drugs and pornography and every kind, of a, every kind of a thing out there. And they're miserable. Sometimes people have to get to the bottom. Please, please don't wait till you get there. Because <laughs> that's no fun. That's no fun. Do, do, you know, listen to the Lord. Let the Lord speak to you. And God spoke to Saul, and he called him. In verse 15 it says, But the Lord said, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings, and children of Israel. When did he call Paul? He called him from his mother's womb. Even though Paul went astray for years, God, the gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. God's not going to let you just do your own thing. God's not going to let you just do whatever you want to do. Somehow, some way, he's going to get your attention. And then you cry out to the Lord. That's what, that's what happens to a lot of people. You get so far down, you cry, you cry out, God, help me. Nobody else can. Well, don't wait for that. Cry out now. Cry out to him now while you can. There are some things I've, been, I've noticed in my life. I've been doing this, I've been a, I've been a believer for, for like 40 years. Actually, it'll be 40 years this year. And I went through churches. I went, you know, through a couple churches. I know church people. I've been around church people. I know what church people are. <clears throat> I've seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people come and go. And really, I asked the Lord about it. I said, what is going on? What, what is going on? What is wrong? Why do these people, 
They get excited about Jesus for a while, and then all of a sudden, they just go back to doing what they did all their life. They, they, just, they just don't get it. But you got to have revelations from God before you get it. So next week, I want to be talking a little bit more about that. But today, I'm going to make two statements to you that I would like you, if you, if you got a pencil and paper, to write them down, to meditate on them. Because you and I, we need to be about our Father's business. There is coming a day when you are going to stand before God. And God is going to, going to question you on what you did with the life he gave you. So a lot of people <clears throat> wonder what to do. Here's the first thing. If you don't know your purpose, your purpose will become clear to you when you know Jesus is your purpose. Your purpose will become clear to you when you know Jesus is your purpose. If it's your purpose in life to be a successful person, that's your purpose, <clears throat> you're never going to know your purpose in life. That's your purpose. That's not God's purpose. When you know Jesus is your purpose, it's all about Jesus. It's about nothing else. Everything's about Jesus. Your life's about Jesus. Jesus is, your, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is everything. When you realize that Jesus is everything, then you will know your purpose in life. Until you know that, until you know it's all about Jesus, you're never going to know your purpose in life. Everything's about Jesus. Your day is about Jesus. Your life is about Jesus. You are made in his image. It's all about Jesus. It's all about the gospel. And you'll never know unless you know he is your all in all. He's your refuge, your fortress. He's the God in whom you trust. Jesus said, without me you can do nothing. When your focus is on Jesus... When he is your love, when he is the love of your life, when his will is your will, then you'll know your purpose in life. Then you'll know the satisfaction. Then you'll know what, what makes you satisfied. All right, your purpose will become clear when you know Jesus is your purpose. The second thing I want you to write down is this. You cannot hear the word of God and not do it. Or else you have not heard it. You cannot hear the word of God and not do it or else you have not heard it. If the Bible says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature and you're not doing it, you haven't heard the word of God. You say, yes, I heard it. it said, Pastor just said it. You heard it with your outer ears. You didn't hear it in your heart. It's not, you haven't really heard it. If you heard me talk about divine healing, divine health, and you're not experiencing divine health, you have not heard the gospel on health yet. If you hear me say, you hear me preach, I preached a sermon the other week on God's prosperity. If you are not prospering, you have not heard the word yet. If you're not doing it. You know, I talked about, about God's prosperity. I talked about things you need to do. You need to be a tither. You need to be a giver. You need to give offerings. You need to give alms. If you're not tithing, not giving offering, you have not heard the word. You do not understand prosperity. If you're not doing what the Bible says, you haven't heard the word. Remember Jesus said many times in the Bible, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear. Why isn't it working? You haven't heard it yet. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You got to hear it. You got to hear it. 
It's got to become real to you. You know, divine healing became real to me when God healed me uh, uh, of, of the flu back in 1983. It became real. But divine health now has become real to me. Or I, my, my whole purpose is to walk in divine health, to never ever be sick, never ever have disease in my body. That's me, that, that is real to me now. That I'm not going to die of cancer. I'm not going to die of viruses. or I'm not going to die of a heart attack. When my body's ready, when I'm ready to go, when that spirit that, is, that has been put inside of this body is ready to go back to, back to God in heaven, I will lay down my body and go to heaven. That is real to me. See, that's how, that's how this, everything has to be real to you. If you're not doing the word, you haven't heard the word. Many people will say, well, pastor, I heard that sermon before. Well, are you doing what it says? See, you can't help but do it when you hear it. You can't, you can't help yourself. Because when the word is alive in you, when it's living and it's real, you're going to do it. You can't help yourself, you're just going to do it. So there are two things I pondered this week when I was on my little retreat or whatever you call it. You cannot hear the word of God and not do it or else you have not heard it. That's why you have to, you have to study to show yourself approved. If, if, what do you want in life? What, do you, what, what, is, what is it that you're looking for? If you're, if you're looking for um, financial freedom, then go find out what God says about finances in the Bible. If you're looking for a, um, a healthier body, go look what God says in there. If you're looking for a, a, a good marriage, then go look what the Bible talks about marriage. Whatever it is that you're looking for, find out what the Word says about it. It's all here. Everything that pertains to life and death is in this book. But this is like this is like a treasure mine. It's like what we would say a gold mine. In here are all, is everything that pertains unto life and death. Everything. You, you can tell them, people can say, well, that's just a book. Right, this is not just a book. This is the word of the living God. This word is alive. It's able to create. It's able to destroy things that, that try to destroy you. It's able to bring things into your life that are not there. That's why God threw in there a few scriptures like, call those things that are not as though they were. Speak unto the mountain. Tell it be cast into the sea. So, them two things. Your purpose will never be clear until you understand Jesus is your purpose. It's all about Jesus. Don't let anything cloud that. Don't let anything go get in the way. You know, a lot of people, a lot of people will put their work, their family, their spouse, money ahead of God. It won't work. You can't, you can't put anything in front of Jesus. Jesus even said in the Bible, he says, if you, if you do not he used the word hate, but it doesn't mean like hate, like you hate, hate with uh, anger. He said, if you, if you don't hate your family, if you don't hate them um, compared to me, you're not even fit to be part of my kingdom. He was making it very, very, very uh, straight to us that if you're, if you're going to follow me, you've got to do it with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind and with all of your strength or else it ain't going to work you know a lot of people say well that's too much for me I can't do that well then 
Live a life of defeat, live a life of sickness, live a life of poverty, live a life of defeat. I mean, that's a choice. Deuteronomy 30, 19, I call, I call heaven and earth as a record against you this day. I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Choose life. What is life? Jesus is life. Choose Jesus. Choose to follow Jesus. Choose to worship Jesus. Choose to do what God says. Choose to do what, what you know about. And everything else works out. See, the funny thing about it is, in our humanity, we kind of say, well, you know, I, you know all, that, all that stuff is good, but I have to take care of my business. I have to take care of my family. I have to, God will take care of all of that if we focus on him, number one. He's first, everything else is behind him. If, if you know that, if you know your purpose is Jesus, you will know your purpose in life, and then your life will be fulfilled. Amen? Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Good to have all of you with us today on Facebook, and uh, we'll see you next week. God bless you. Have a great week.